Okay, in this last section, we would like to add yet another, uh, another ingredient to our uh, oscillator. So, so far we have looked at an oscillator uh, with uh, a force that depends on the, 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 the separation, basically for, to, the, to, to the equilibrium points, Hooke's law. Then we added some damping, which was a force that was actually trying to reduce uh, it was against the velocity, so a force that, that was proportional to the velocity, but with a minus sign. And finally, we want to see how we can actually include energy into the system, so how we, we can inject energy into the system. And we are going to do this by uh, including a sinusoidal driving force. So basically what we are doing, we are including energy into the system uh, in an oscillatory manner. So now that we've said this, we can write the equation on Newton's law. And uh, what we see, uh, the three terms on the left, uh, the, the terms that we saw uh, before for, uh, for the damp oscillator. So just as a, as a reminder, the acceleration, Hooke's law, and the damping factor. And the right hand side will be a driving force. So we are starting to accumulate the frequencies and, and, and symbols and so on. So I'd like to insist on the fact that omega, in this case, is a parameter, if you will. It's an external, uh, it's, it's the frequency at which you're actually applying the force. So omega is a parameter of the problem. And you see that the force is actually uh, time dependent. So it's an oscillatory force, F0 being a constant. Now we are going to rewrite this equation again so that we put an x dot dot uh, uh, without, uh, without a prefactor. So we end up with this equation. We've done this a number of times already. And uh, we need to solve this problem. And uh, we have to find a solution to this, to this uh, uh, differential equation. Well, it, the solution to this equation is the usual approach that we learn in uh, ordinary differential equation. Uh, we have two parts. The first is a solution, uh, sorry about that. Uh, the first is a solution to, to the equation without the right hand side, which we actually know already because this is the damp oscillator that we saw in the previous screencast. And two, we want a solution that reproduces the right hand side. So we co call that a uh, complementary function and then a particular uh, function. So the complementary function, we've discussed it at, at length in the damp oscillator screencast, uh, where we have the underdamped, overdamped, and critically damped. Uh, the solution is, is here. So this is the solution of the equation in the blue box without the right-hand side. And the particular solution we are going to try as a solution, um, um, a cosine, okay? And we are going to see that uh, the cosine uh, actually should, should work. But we are going, we are going to, to study this. So the particular solution, uh, let's try to see how this particular solution that we, we suggest here with D and delta being element that we have to determine, uh, let's see if it's, if it's a possible solution to the equation in blue. So we, go, we are going to introduce the equation uh, in, that, in, that, in the, this solution XP in that equation and see if it's possible. So as always, I know that students always remember trigonometry very well, uh, but it's probably a good idea to remember that trigonometry is always your friend. So uh, some equations that you might find useful. And then what we do, we insert XP into uh, as a possible solution on the equation on the top. And then we end up with two, those two solutions, those two, that's, that equation, sorry. And so what we see here, it's something that's, uh, that's interesting is that we have a term that depends on, the, a term in front of cosine omega t and a term in, in front of sine omega t. However, cosine omega t and sine omega t are independent uh, function, uh, so linearly independent function. Therefore, in order for this equation to be always true for any time, we need the two coefficients of front of cosine omega t and in front of sine omega t to be zero. And in fact, by doing so, we will be able to determine the two unknown, which are d and delta. So let's start with the simplest one, which is this term. So this term should be equal to zero in order to ensure that the function is zero. Uh, the other term will also need to be zero. We'll discuss that in a few minutes. So uh, we see directly that for this to be zero, uh, if we divide by uh, cosine delta left and right, 
we see that we find that the tangent of delta should be 2 omega beta divided by omega 0 square minus omega square. Just to remind you, omega 0 is the natural frequency of the undamped oscillator that we've discussed since the beginning of this chapter. Omega is a driving force, the driving frequency of the force, at the frequency of the driving force, sorry, that we, that we have introduced. And delta is really, when you think about it, when you, when you go back to the equation that we used as xp, delta is a dephasing between the application of the driving force and the response. So delta is really kind of a delay, if you will, uh, between the application of a force and the, the, the maximum of the response. Now, um, so we have this solution. Again, it's a good idea to remember some trigonometry, and that allows us to calculate sine delta and cosine delta. This is pretty elementary from, uh, from trigonometry. OK, so we had this equation that has to be equal to 0. We already focused on the second part. Now let's look at this first part. So we want this to be equal to 0. And that allows me to find the, the value of a, OK? Uh, actually, the value of d as a function of a. And then when we see this, we see that in, in the denominator, we have a cosine delta and a sine delta. But we already calculated sine delta and cosine delta in the previous slide. So when we substitute, we find that the value of d, which is the amplitude of the solution, the particular solution, is going to be given by this equation here. So the amplitude is going to depend on a number of things. It's going to depend on the damping. It's going to depend on the driving frequency and also on the natural frequency. So when we put everything together, we see that the particular solution of the problem um, uh, is completely known now. The particular solutions, solutions are completely known because we just described delta and we described uh, d. So this is the solution, this is the exact solution. Uh, and then as I discussed already, delta will be the phase difference between the, the maximum of the driving force and the, result, the maximum of the resultant motion. Uh, interestingly enough, this, um, this, this phase, this uh, phase difference, delta, actually depends on the driving frequency. Okay. Now, um, uh, for example, I'm sorry, for example, uh, just an example on the last slide, on, on the last line of this slide, we see that if there is no driving frequency, of course, there is no delay, obviously. There is a delay of pi over 2 at the frequency omega equal omega 0 and, of, and a, def, a dephasing of pi when the frequency is extremely large. So that's going to give, you know, like a, the response of the system is actually delayed compared to the application of the force. So what have we done in the past seven minutes and a half? Well, we've we found a solution uh, to, the, to, the to, the, to the damp oscillator with a driving force. And we saw that the solution is the sum of a particular solution and of the complementary solution. So xc is what we did in the previous screencast, and xp is the particular solution. So here is something that's very important to notice. Uh, what I'm going to argue about now is that in steady state, so in, the lo in long time scales, what matters is xp. In fact, xc, the complementary, represents a, tr a transient effect. So transient effect, I affect the die out quickly. And let me explain to you why. So I reproduce the plot there that we saw in the previous screencast into the damp oscillator. And we see that in each case, the amplitude after a while goes to 0. So xc, after sufficiently long time, xc will go to 0. So after you start the motion, if you wait long enough, the solution in blue will actually no longer matter. So this, these effects will, will die out. And so the only thing that's going to survive is xp. Okay, so this is the situation in, in a steady state. And you can ask, uh, when, what is long enough time? Well, the time that's long enough will be the one where the time, where the exponential, which remember the exponential was e to the power minus beta t, when that exponential is low enough. So in other words, when the time, uh, when beta t is large enough, so in other words, when the time is much larger than 1 over, over beta. So if you have a very, if you have a very damp situation, so beta is very large. The time uh, it takes to get to steady state is very small. Okay? So at that time, we are going to suppose that the blue solution is actually not going to matter anymore because we waited long enough so that the exponential uh, goes, got to zero.
So we only have to worry about xp. And we do that, we see that uh, depending on the frequency at which we drive the system, we are going to have what's called the resonant phenomena. In fact, it's pretty straightforward to understand the resonant phenomena now that we understood how to calculate the amplitude of the particular solution. So the amplitude of a particular solution will, for example, will be given by this equation we just calculated. And we see that, we see that this amplitude actually depends on the frequency. And we can ask ourselves, what's the resonant frequency? In other words, what's the frequency of the maximum amplitude? And then we know, since we have a, a, the, the numerator is a constant, uh, we just have to minimize the denominator. Uh, this is a straightforward uh, derivative. So you try to minimize, to, to make a derivative equal to zero. And we find that the, the maximum of, the, of d will be obtained by frequency omega r is equal to omega 0 square minus 2 beta square. So if you, are, if you are driving your system at a frequency that's given by the equation here at the bottom of the slide, this is when you have the maximum, uh, basically maximum motion, maximum solution, maximum amplitude and motion. So we call this a resonant frequency, omega r, omega 0 square minus 2 beta square. And then we see that this, damp this uh, resonant frequency can be modulated by changing uh, the damping. So there's a lot of damping. Uh, uh, I mean, if the damping is fairly large, uh, not too large, but let's say fairly large, so that omega 0 square minus 2 beta square is a positive, still a positive number, then the fre resonant frequency goes down. Uh, there's no resonance, however, if, the, if, omega, if 2 beta square is larger than omega 0 square. Because in that case, the, the resonant frequency is, is actually a, a complex number, uh, which actually it's an imaginary, and then we would have a, 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 a monot monotonic decrease. So that's uh, something that's important to notice. Okay, so just to, just to summarize a little bit what we've done so far, we've looked at a number of frequencies. We've looked at, uh, when we looked at free oscillations, no damping, no force. We found the natural frequency, omega 0 square equal k over m. When we look at uh, damping, we find that we had, uh, we had an omega 1 square equal omega 0 square and beta square. Uh, this frequency omega 1 could be either an oscillation, like in the under damping, or uh, it's no longer an oscillation when we are, for example, in overdamping. But in the underdamping, which is actually the, situ the, the solution that's written on this slide uh, with the envelope function, omega one is a frequency, not so much of a periodicity of the of the of the of the response, since the the the, amp the amplitude goes down, so you don't repeat uh, the same solution, but as a f as basically the the frequency between maxima. And finally, for the driven oscillation we find uh, another important frequency, which is the resonant frequency. So you see, when you look at these three frequencies, which are typical frequencies for, uh, for our driven uh, oscillation, that omega zero is always larger than omega one, and which is, which is itself always larger than omega r. Now, uh, it turns out that driving system uh, at resonant frequency is something that's, that's uh, it's very important for devices and for to get the best response, the maximum response from a system. And so these are, these are used in many, many different situations, like for example, in, a, in loudspeakers or in a quantum resonators where we ha want to have the maximum response. Uh, you see that as well, in, in, even in, a, in a NMR, actually, this is how it works in the MRI and in, in nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, every time there's a resonance, we would like to maximize uh, the the response, and so for this to maximize the response, we call the, this quality factor, and the quality factor Q is defined as the frequency of the resonance divided by twice um, the damping factor. Of course, the 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 quality factor will be much larger if we have very little damping, very little loss, right? So if we have no damping, in fact, Q is going to be very large, but if we have very large damping we can even end up in a situation when there is no more resonance. And in fact, you can see that very easily if you plot the amplitude D uh, on this, which is the left hand side, the resonance is always shows as, as a spike, which is broader and broader as the damping increases. So a, gra uh, 
uh, as a larger damping means uh, it's equivalent on the figure to a smaller uh, quality factor. And in fact, there is a place where beta is so large that there is no resonance, as we discussed uh, in the previous slide. And on the right hand side, you, you have the value of the dephasing delta, uh, which goes, uh, of course, uh, from the maximum at uh, infinite um, um, quality, in other words, there's no damping, to, uh, to, 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 the, to the flatter situation when there is a very, very large damping at q equals zero. So as I mentioned, uh, oscillators uh, can, and resonators can be found in many different circumstances, not just mechanical effect. Each time we have uh, Newton's law where the, f the intrinsic force is, depends on, on, on the variable directly, like, just like Hooke's law, we, we find situations like this. So in mechanical system, like a loudspeaker, the quality factor will be about 100. But in quantum devices, it could be up to 10 to the power 14. Our uh, uh, electrical circuit is al are also well described. So AC circuit are also described as resonators. And so all those quality factors, of course, are very important so that we have a sharp response and a very large response. OK, now, uh, remember, we, want, we are going to, talk uh, we're going to talk about one last thing, which is the frequency for the kinetic energy resonance. Um, because, OK, remember, you have your system. It's actually an oscillator, which is damped and driven by an external force. Um, and we, we do not expect the energy to be constant, of course, because first of all, we have an outside force, so which is keeps pumping energy, but also damping, which keeps taking energy in friction and dissipation. So we can, we can ask uh, if we were to monitor the kinetic energy resonance, how, I mean, the, the kinetic energy, does it, is there a frequency at which it, there is a maximum uh, energy? Uh, kinetic energy. And so it's pretty easy to calculate because we know that the kinetic energy is just one half mx dot square. We know x, so x dot is easy to calculate just like this. And if we calculate the square, we obtain an equation like this. Now the problem is that we don't like equation like this because this is the kinetic energy as a function of time. Uh, so it's, we would like to get rid of the time. So what it's typical to do is to calculate the average kinetic energy. And you calculate the average kinetic energy. So basically, average kinetic energy will be the average over one, between two maxima, if you will. And so you obtain this by calculating the average of sine square. Why do we do sine square? Well, because this is the only uh, function that depends on time in the kinetic energy. And so we end up, uh, the, uh, over a period of oscillation, we find the average kinetic energy will be given by this equation, which is, of course, depends on the frequency. Now. Uh, Let me reproduce that equation on the next slide. And so what we see is that, in fact, if you were to calculate the maximum uh, uh, at what frequency the, the response, the, uh, the, the expectation value of kinetic energy is the maximum, you will see that it will happen at omega e equal omega naught, which is the cr natural frequency of the system for undamped oscillation. So that's very interesting because this is different. So it turns out the, the maximum um, frequency at which the system has an average kinetic, the maximum average kinetic energy is not the same frequency at which the, the displacement is the largest. So, um, so we can, so this is interesting. And on top of that, we can also look at the other contribution to energy, which is the potential energy. But that one is easy to see where the maximum contribution to potential energy will be, because it will be, the largest will be when the displacement is the largest. And of course, this person is the largest at omega r. So you see kinetic energy and potential energy reach the maximum at different time. Uh, by the way, this is not um, completely surprising that they do not happen at the same time, since, of course, we do not have a conservative system at all. The total energy is not conserved. We have damping, and then we also have a pumping of energy. So this is. Uh, it's pretty fascinating, and it turns out that uh, the application of this uh, of this framework is much much broader than than just uh, uh, mechanical systems. In fact, the number of equations that you find in physics that will that will look very much like the ones we looked at today um, is very very large, uh, and it in, involves quantum system, it involves mechanical system, electrical system, uh, all sort of system where you have 
where you are pumping energy in the system and where there is also damping, so, so dissipation of energy. So I hope it was clear. I hope that you enjoyed this screencast and uh, uh, we'll see you in class. Thank you.